I'm here to talk to you about diving with oceanic white tips and give you some safe diving uh, practices and guidelines to dive with these sharks. Um, I'm a doctor of biology, so I want to introduce myself a little bit more to you before we uh, start with the presentation. Um, so yeah, my name is Elke Wojanowski, uh, it's German. I'm living here in Egypt now for 16 years. Uh, I studied biology, did a PhD on actually dolphin behavior before I came here. And then in 2004, I started working on the liverwort sea in Egypt. So I'm a biologist, I'm working as a dive guide as well for the last 16 years. And throughout all these 16 years, I've been collecting information on the oceanic white tips here in Egypt. So I have a huge database, I'm running a, ch a trust, a charity that's called Red Sea Sharks. So this is why I was asked by the CDWS to do presentations for the guides uh, on oceanic white tip sharks and on how to safely dive with them. So this is the idea for these presentations. Uh, the presentations actually will be happening in um, six parts. So today we're doing the first part, uh, but just to go through the different ones as we move along. So today I will be talking about shark sensory systems with you, uh, then part two, the next one on uh, biology of oceanic white sharks and their behavior. I will be talking about how to dive with them safely, so guidelines, safe diving practices with them. Uh, then I will give you a summary of pre-dive information for your guests, that will be part five. And then finally, part six, I will say a few more things about shark monitoring here in Egypt uh, that I've been doing and that I have been involved in. Okay, so let's dive in. Part number one for today, I want to talk about shark sensory systems. I think it's extremely important that people that are interacting with sharks actually know how they perceive their world. If you know this, it's much easier to predict, to understand, or to interpret actually the behavior of the sharks that you might have around you that you hopefully meet while you're diving. So let's start with shark sensory systems. Um, I want to do this by approaching a hypothetical shark from a distance. So I'm going to start with a sense that is the furthest reaching actually. And this is hearing. Uh, why is hearing the furthest reaching sense? That's actually quite simple. Sharks live in water. Water is a perfect medium for sound propagation. And that is especially true if like in the case of sharks, you're actually very sensitive in the low frequency ranges. Now, if I say low frequency ranges, I mean below our hearing range, below the human hearing range. Because sharks uh, have been known to react to sounds uh, from about 10 to 100 hertz. Our hearing starts at about 200 hertz and goes up to uh, 20 kilohertz, maybe, something like this. Yeah, so sharks are very sensitive in low frequency ranges. And of course, this is the ones that are traveling extremely far underwater. With the right sound source, this can actually be kilometers underwater that they can hear something. Uh, and sharks are especially attracted to low frequency sounds when they're irregular pulsating. Yeah, and what does that mean? It means it's not a rhythmic sinus sound, but it's something irregular. And again, that makes sense. Most sharks are predators. They're looking for prey, and especially they're looking for prey that is in trouble. And anything that is in trouble is flopping around uncontrolled with their fins. And this is the kind of low frequency, irregular sound that will attract the shark. Yeah, so this is the explanation. Yeah, so this is the idea for hearing. Uh, and because sharks are reacting to low frequency sounds that are irregular, that's also one reason why sharks are reacting more to people that are nervous underwater. A nervous person underwater will have a different heart rate than a calm person underwater and sharks can perceive it and they will be more interested. They will not be aggressive towards it but they might get more curious around it, especially in comparison to other people that are more calm. Yeah, so this is the idea why also around sharks you should try to stay calm because your heart rate otherwise might give interesting signals to a shark that is already around you. Okay, so this is sense number one, first reaching sense. The next one that will kick into action would be the smell or chemoreception. Uh, that's a very interesting one and this is one that sharks are very well known for. Uh, this sense is situated in the two paired nostrils that every shark has. Here, left and right side of the head, on the underside of their heads. You see the skin flaps on the outside and these skin flaps are actually channeling the water flow through these nostrils. Yeah, we'll take one as an example. So you see here, this is the water flow, so it's channeled through this opening all the way around and then comes back outside. And on the inside of the nostril, this is the interesting part here, this is actually membranes stacked up in lamellae. So you have a massive surface of membranes and this is where the smelling actually happens. Okay? So in these membranes, you have a lot of what we call chemoreceptor cells 
It's a very simple system actually. You have the receptor cell, and this receptor cell will accept a certain molecule that drifts by in the water. So the water drifts past these membranes, and these different molecules are connecting to their specific receptor cells. And then the brain analyzes which kind of receptor cell was activated at the same time, and then they can, from the composition of the molecules, they can decide what kind of chemical trail was just drifting past. Is that interesting? Is it something that I want to approach? Is it maybe something I want to stay away from because it's indicating danger? Or is it something that I don't know at all and I'm simply going to ignore? Yeah, this is the decision that they make. And so that sharks can quickly approach an interesting chemical trail, which would be food for them. They can also tell the difference in the intensity between the two nostrils. So they swim through a chemical trail, and then basically they can decide when the intensity is exactly the same between these two nostrils, and then they know they're heading straight for the source of this chemical trail. It's a very specific sense. It has to be. Because otherwise, sharks would be wasting a lot of time and energy potentially swimming in the wrong direction. So they have learned to be very specific when it comes to analyzing any kind of smells that they can pick up underwater. Okay? And that also explains why one of the major myths around sharks is actually not true. Sharks have absolutely no interest in human blood. Yeah? They don't have no idea what it is. It will not trigger a feeding frenzy, it will not cause them to swim away. Most sharks completely ignore human blood because they've never smelled this kind of composition before. Yeah? So all the hysteria about a bit of human blood and you have sharks coming to you and like starting a feeding frenzy, this is really only myth. It's a very sensitive sense, it's very specific, and they learn to focus on stuff that is relevant for them, and humans actually are not. We have nothing to do with their normal lives. Okay? So that is their smelling sense. Uh, then the third sense that would be kicking in after hearing and smelling would be the vision. Obviously sharks have eyes, um, one on either side of their heads, and if you've ever seen a similar image of a human eye, you will actually not see many differences. So you can go through the list. We also have eyelids, we have the cornea, we have the lens behind the cornea. Uh, this lens is suspended in a certain way for us as well. Then you have the eyeball, then you have the retina here behind it with the photoreceptor cells, and then finally the optic nerve that sends the information to the brain. So exactly like a human eye. Of course, interesting difference is what's happening here on the retina. This is also about how and what do sharks actually see. Uh, the human uh, eye has two different photoreceptor cells. One whole set is for photovision uh, or for color vision, and the other one is actually for uh, black and white. Yeah, this is contrast vision in low light, low light conditions. Sharks have the two same systems. Uh, the system in low light conditions, black and white, is about 10 times better than in humans. The color vision is more restricted though. The sharks live in the water, so they don't need to see the full range of the whole spectrum because as all the divers know very well, you go in the water and the color red is absorbed very quickly. Then orange disappears, yellow disappears. So sharks actually, as typical animals living underwater, they're focusing in their color vision on blue and green. So it's a bit more monochromatic, so they don't actually differ between that many colors. Yeah, so that's something interesting actually as well. And of course, one thing that we don't have which is written here as the nictitating membrane. This is a membrane coming up from the bottom of the eye to cover the cornea or to cover the eye. Uh, and sharks need that, like oceanics, because their eyelids, the lower and the upper eyelid, are stiff. They cannot close their eyes. So they need something to protect them so that they're not getting damaged. So they're using this opaque white membrane to protect their eyes. Uh, and this is what it looks like here. This oceanic put up the left nictitating membrane over his eye because he was very close to a camera. So any kind of sudden movement towards the eye could damage it. Yeah? So that it doesn't happen when they come close to objects that they're investigating or before they're feeding, they literally blind themselves. And again, for somebody interacting with an animal like this, this is important to know. You have a blind shark next to you. So any quick movements that you are making at this point, they don't see. There's other senses in play, but the direct visual control of the situation, they're giving up on so that they can keep their eyes safe from being damaged. Yeah? So this is very important about their eyesight. It never takes long. They don't take this away for unnecessary reasons. So the moment the shark swims away a little bit, the nictitating membrane will come down again and they can see again. But for this very short moment where the eye is white, 
they are literally blind on this side. Yeah, so this is an important one. Okay, then uh, the fourth sense that is kicking in is a sense, again, very typical for water. Uh, that's a pressure sense. It's called lateral line system, and sharks are actually sharing this with the other fish uh, in the water, with bony fish. Uh, this sense is a system of pores. Yeah, this goes all the way around the head, and then there's a line of these pores all the way up to the tail. Um, you can see it in the picture, hopefully, a little bit here on the screen. You have these little dots here behind the eye of the shark, and they're actually all around the head. This is these uh, pores, the opening to the outside of this lateral line system. And what happens is an animal that moves on the side of the shark creates pressure changes. These pressure changes, these are the pores here, this is the surface, the skin of the shark. So the water pressure changes go into the pores, they move this jelly pad that is sitting on hair cells. And then the information from the movement of these hair cells again is given to the brain. Yeah, so from animals moving along the whole side of the body of the shark, they will get information what kind of objects they actually are. Because obviously different animals are moving differently and they're creating a different pattern of pressure changes that will go into these channels. A turtle swims different from a fish, a tuna swims different from an Napoleon before they do because they're using different fins to swim. Yeah, so this kind of information a shark can analyze and that obviously works all the way into complete darkness because the pressure changes, they can still feel. Yeah? So this is an important sense to basically orient yourself and to know what's going on all the way along the side of your body, even if you cannot see it. Yeah? So that's a, an important one. And this lateral line system also explains uh, why sharks are circling objects that they're interested in. They're not aggressive, they're trying to figure out what these objects are. So even if a human being is being circled by a shark, it simply means that the shark wants to use the whole side, the whole natural line system, to analyze the movement patterns and to understand what this object is. Yeah, so if that happens, just stay calm, turn with the shark, make sure that the shark knows you've seen it. We'll come to this point at a later stage here. But this is an important one. Make sure that you see what the shark is doing around you, but then just let him sort out and try to figure out what you are. If you don't actually do anything that gets his interest, most sharks, they will do one or two circles maximum, and then they will leave. Actually, most sharks are not even brave enough to come this close, but for the ones that are, they're simply curious and want to know what you are. Stay calm, turn with them, let them complete the circle, and then let them swim away. So they only approach you with the head first and turn away. They can only use the lateral line on here on the side one time. So to fully use the whole system, they really need to swim full circles around an object, uh, an object, and that's what they do. They try to figure out what this object is because of the movement patterns inside. Okay, so this is the lateral line system, that's sense number four. Uh, then we come closer to the shark still, the pressure system, lateral line system works maybe one or two body lengths away from the shark, unless you have really high pressure differences. So now we're within, let's say, two body lengths of the shark. Coming a bit closer, we come to a very, very special sense of sharks, actually. Sharks belong to the few animals that can detect electricity. And they use this, or they do this, with the help of the so-called ampullae of Lorenzini. Uh, that's a descriptive term, ampullae, because of what these organs look like, and I'll show you this in a second. And Lorenzini is the Italian physician that first identified this sense. So this is situated on the underside of the snout of sharks. And again, here now you see lots of little dark spots. This is the opening pores of the underlying ampullae of Lorenzini. And that's what they look like. Yeah? So these are the opening points here that you saw here, these little spots everywhere. And then you have these ampulla-shaped inserts. And first what you have is a highly conductive gel. And then down here at the bottom of each of these ampullae, you have uh, very sensitive electroreceptor cells. Yeah, and with these receptor cells, sharks can pick up electricity that is basically produced by every living organism. Um, a lot of the processes in the bodies of animals and humans actually are done by electricity. If you have nerves that are firing, there's electricity going through them. Muscles that are contracting, they have electricity running through them. So sharks have a sensitive enough system to pick up these electric currents, and again, the information is then given to the brain, and the brain will analyze what this means. I'll show you a video as an example for how a shark can use that kind of sense. The sharks that are best known to actually use the electric sense are hammerhead sharks. 
Yeah, this is one of the reasons why we believe that this weird head shape uh, extension to the side has evolved, because of course if you extend the head to the side, then there's a lot more space for a lot more of these ampullae of Lorenzini underneath it. So this is the idea. So, quick video. And this shows you, first of all, a juvenile ras that buries itself in the sand for protection, and along comes a juvenile scalloped hammerhead shark. And this hammerhead shark now scans the sandy area with the underside of his hammer like a metal detector, because he can detect that there's a tiny electric field coming from the ras, but of course it's tiny, so it will take some time to pinpoint the location of this ras, actually. Um, and you can also see with the help of the hammer as an additional steering device, these sharks can make very tight turns. So now he's located the source, he dipped down with the lower jaw under the sand and picked up this uh, ras. Yeah, this is the idea for the electric sense. And as you can see in the video, this is a close range sense. So the shark had to be very close to the sand actually to pick up this tiny electric field. Yeah, this is the idea. Okay? Um, so we're coming closer and closer now to the object that they're actually examining. So after the electroreception, as I said, getting even closer to the shark, we now come to the sense of touch. Very basic sense, open nerve endings in the skin that react to direct physical pressure. So sharks have those as well. And then finally, another contact sense, and the last one is taste. Yeah, the final decision for a shark to decide if something is edible or food will be to take it in his mouth and to use his taste buds to check if this is a familiar taste or if this is sort of an attractive taste for them. Yeah, this is the idea. So from potentially a few kilometers away, all these different senses are kicking in in order until finally a shark takes something in his mouth and decides if it's food. And all the way along these steps, it's a decision process. A shark will hear something and then will decide, do I want to approach it, yes or no. Then the smell is added. Is it interesting enough to approach or no? So all the way along, it's a yes or no decision until the final one is made here. Uh, most sharks, actually, when it comes to interacting with people, they turn away here. They see us from a distance and they don't want nothing further to do with us. They're very shy, they're very easily intimidated by us, so they go. And this is also an experience that a lot of divers have. The sharks turn away just at the edge of vision and we never get much closer. For most of us, and I'm including myself here, I would like it to stop sort of here. Yeah, I don't really want to be touched or tasted by a shark, but again, there's very, very few sharks that will be bold enough or courageous enough or curious enough to come this close to a human being. Of course, the sharks that I'm talking about in this whole series of presentations, the oceanic white tip shark, is one of the few that has the courage, that has the uh, self-confidence to do that, and that's exactly why we need to talk about them, so that we can safely dive with them. All these senses are something that sharks are sharing. This is not specific for oceanics. Yeah, but from the next presentation forwards, we're going to talk specifically about the oceanics, what makes them so special, and why we need to take certain precautions to interact with them safely. And this is actually uh, presentation number one, part one. I uh, hope you enjoyed it, and uh, maybe you tune in for number two as well. Thank you very much.